Um, Jim Ferrari is a longtime friend of Georgia Audubon and a member and has traveled with us. And um, he's also very active with the Macon chapter, which is, um, I know that I guess this right, at Mulgee Audubon. There's lots of Audubon chapters to start with O, and he is active with the Mulgee chapter. He is also a professor of biology and the department chair for bio biology at Wesleyan College in Macon. His research interests include the ecology of fruit-eating birds, seasonal patterns of bird diversity, vulture migration and flocking behavior, leaf litter dispersal, and the effects of leaf decomposition on soil nitrogen cycling rates in forest ecology. Um, he, is a facet, he has some fascinating research and we look forward to hearing it. So Jim, I will turn it over to you. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Stadi, for that introduction. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thanks for being here. As Dadi mentioned, um, I'm in the biology department at Wesleyan College. My formal training is as a forest ecologist, but I am a, a longtime birder, really, since college. And since coming to Georgia um, about 25 years ago, I've merged both birds and plants into my research. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so hopefully you can see that okay. Uh, so my title, Reflections from a Bird Bath, What Game Cameras Can Teach Us About Fruit-Eating Birds. This, uh, as Dottie mentioned, September is Georgia Grows Native for Birds Month. Uh, this is an event sponsored by or hosted by Georgia Audubon Society. And you heard about all the great events associated with this month from the, uh, the tour of backyard wildlife sanctuaries to the native plant sales to a webinar about how to create your own uh, backyard nature sanctuary. So where does this talk fit in? <clears throat> it's not really a gardening or a horticulture talk, I, I would say. And it's not really even explicitly <clears throat> about the value of native plants. Although if you read between the lines, that's, that's there for sure. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover the ecology of birds and how they interact with native plants in our yards. All right, but let's think for a moment about, <clears throat> about native plants and what exactly native plants do for birds. What kind of value do they have for birds? Well, they provide shelter, also known as cover. They uh, provide roosts, perches for birds, in other words, structure for their environment. Uh, they provide nest sites. Think about, say, an old tree, an old snag with uh, holes for woodpeckers, but also nesting materials. Nectar, so like this uh, trumpet honeysuckle down at the lower left, provides nectar for hummingbirds. Seeds, of course, uh, plenty of birds like cardinals and house finches and so on are seed eaters. And uh, very importantly, especially if you are, have been following the work of Douglas Tallamy, um, plants provide, especially native plants, provide insect food for birds. What I'm gonna emphasize though, is the role of native plants in providing fruit. Not all birds are fruit eaters, but many rely very heavily on, on fruit and especially fruit from, from native plants. All right, so as I mentioned, I. Uh, I'm a forest ecologist, but when I moved to Georgia, I was kind of thrashing about for some new research program. And I settled on, I decided I could merge my love of birds with my interests in forest ecology. And so I started studying fruit eating birds. And I've done this uh, for over 20 years now. But one way I've done it, studied fruit eating birds, is to just make ad hoc observations. Um, so when you're out in the field and you happen to see a particular bird like this robin, eating a uh, fruit, in this case, a laurel cherry, I would simply make a, make a note. So it was just very low key kind of research for it, involving binoculars and a writing implement and an index card. Um, I'll say more about that in a second and I'll show you some of my data. Uh, and then another way that I've studied fruit eating birds is by visiting uh, a banding station where um, uh, birds are fitted with, with aluminum leg bands. And, um, and I've, I've examined those birds and, and 
at the banding station and learned some about their fruit eating habits. All right, so let's jump right in here. Um, <clears throat> when my girls were little, especially, I spent a lot of time in the yard, puttering around the yard with them, pushing them on the swing and paying attention to the birds in my yard and what those birds were doing. I had this wonderful mulberry tree and um, I would pay close attention to when those fruits were ripe, which birds were, were eating the mulberry fruits. And so it just from, this is not my current yard, it's an old yard, but had 24 different bird species eating, eating the fruits of red mulberry. So that's one way you can study the fruit eating habits of birds is just, um, this was on a, on a casual basis. I mean, I did it uh, for a number of years, but uh, you can over the years accumulate a pretty good data set of what, what birds eat what kinds of fruits, when those fruits are available and so on. All right, moving on though to studying banded birds. This work was done a number of years ago um, with uh, my friends at the Jekyll Island Banding Station down the coast. And I visited one year and I noticed that um, as they were working with the birds, here, here this is a gray catbird being fitted with a leg band. Uh, I noticed that those birds, they were put in um, little cloth holding bags prior to, after their removal from the nets and before the birds were processed, they were put in a cloth holding bag to keep the birds calm and um, before they were processed. And so what I noticed was, I mean, you can't help but notice here, but the cloth bag, uh, this one housed a catbird and it was stained purple. And so I was well prepared to appreciate, I guess, the significance of this and thought, well, this would be maybe one way of studying, a different way of studying fruit eating birds is to go to the banding station. And then after the birds are removed from the bags, take a look and see what kind of seeds are, are in those bags. So just here is an example, this is a close up of some pokeweed seeds. Pokeweed is, a, it turns out is a, is a favorite of um, gray catbirds. And so there are a couple seeds here that are visible, these shiny black discs, plus there's some pulp and fruit skins staining that cloth holding bag. So if you're systematic about it and you go back for a couple seasons, so this was 2010, here we see four seeds from Beautyberry. These are the seeds up at the top, the little seeds. And then these are two Virginia creeper seeds. That's a vine. And then here's a pokeweed seed. But this entire sample from just one bird had uh, 39 beautyberry seeds um, plus another Virginia creeper seed. So sometimes these birds would deposit quite a few seeds into these cloth holding bags. And again, as I said, if you're systematic, you do this over a couple of seasons. So this was just for gray cat birds, looking at their uh, fruit selection. And it turns out that um, not quite half of those, uh, the fecal samples from these birds yielded beautyberry seeds. Virginia creeper uh, was another real favorite. This is a very high quality fruit. Um, pepper vine um, is, is one that you may find and uh, it's common there on the south end of Jekyll where it's kind of a scrubby habitat. Wax myrtle, more of a coastal species, but you'll see it planted uh, at least here in Macon. Tough buckthorn, definitely a coastal species. Uh, and then pokeweed. Um, and that, that work culminated in publication in 2009 with my friend Jerry Payne of uh, a work called The Ecology of Fruit Eating Birds in Georgia. This is unfortunately out of print, but if you are at the GOS meeting in October this fall, I'll be there and I'll have a handful of copies if anybody's interested. Okay, so that's, that's what I've done um, previously, different kinds of approaches to studying fruit eating birds, but my current project uh, involves a little bit of a different twist and that's where the bird bath comes in. This is my, uh, my, my yard here in suburban Macon, Georgia. You can tell it's, it's just a pretty typical suburban kind of area with, with some pretty good tree cover, some, some large trees. This is an established neighborhood, uh, but it's not a particularly big property, but it's where I spend a lot of time and I, and I pay close attention to what the birds are doing. And of course I have feeders and I have uh, a bird bath. And the bird bath caught my attention uh, when I realized that birds were depositing seeds when they came to bathe or drink, they would deposit seeds. So here, this is back from 2016, but here's a smilax seed. Smilax is a kind of a thorny native vine. And, uh, and then we see a bunch of these black disc-like seeds from pokeweed as well. And this is in some feces of some unidentified bird. Um, here was another great haul. This was a day when there were a whole bunch of beautyberry seeds, plus some Virginia creeper and, and a black gum seed, black gum also um, called, um, oh gosh, well, it's Nyssa, Nyssa sylvatica. 
um, is another, another is the Latin name for that tree. And so I started thinking, well, maybe I could use the bird bath as a kind of seed trap. And if I was systematic about this, I might have another way of learning about um, seed dispersal uh, by birds and also about their fruit choices. So what did I, what have I done exactly? Um, it's kind of a sprawling project actually. And I started seven years ago and that began with just identifying the, collecting the seeds from the bird bath and identifying that them. And so I've been doing that since 2015 um, and I continue doing that um, and probably will at least through the fall. About a year into that, I realized, well, you know, I really should be paying attention also to what birds are visiting the bird bath. So I got serious about that about just making bird observations. And I say they're ad libitum because I wasn't particularly systematic. Um, so I didn't go out for 10 minutes a day and watch the bird bath in some rigorous scientific way, but I did pay a lot of attention, made many, many observations over the years of what birds were, were visiting. Um, but eventually it dawned on me that, you know, it's great. I'm, I'm, I have these bird observations, I'm collecting these seeds. I don't actually know which birds though are depositing these seeds. And so that's when I got the idea, well, I'll add a game camera, I'll set up a game camera. And uh, so I've been doing that now for, as of September 1st for, um, for over, well, for, for one year, and I'm gonna continue through this fall. So what do I do exactly for, for this project? Well, um, first of all, I clean and fill the bird bath regularly, pretty much every day. I record um, just uh, when I'm around the house or if I look out the window, which is often, I'll just record the birds that I see visiting the bird bath. If they're drinking, they're bathing, I'll make a note about that. And then every day when I, uh, as I'm cleaning the bath, I will collect, count, and identify all the seeds. And also sometimes I I've learned that it's important to note where those seeds are in the bird bath. It's helpful later in reconstructing who exactly deposited those seeds. And then you just repeat uh, for, for a number of years. Here's the setup, uh, just showing a little bit of my backyard. It's not a particularly fancy game camera. Uh, it was, I'm sure, less than $100, but here's my bird bath, just your classic concrete uh, bird bath, big pine tree in the back, couple pine trees. Here's a red bud. Here's this kayak that I really need to put in the basement. Um, and the way I set it up was I know that game cameras can be motion sensitive, um, but I, my experience is that that doesn't work great for birds because birds are small and also fast moving. So a lot of times by the time that function um, kicks in, the motion detection kicks in, the bird is long gone. So instead I decided I would simply set it up, I would program the camera so it would take one photo every minute from dawn to dusk. Uh, and then I adjust that, the, the timing, because of course day length changes during the year. And then I set it to take uh, to, with a resolution, I guess, or a file size of um, eight megapixels per photo. So depending on the time of year, it might be 700, 800 photos uh, a day. Um, just here's an example. This is from November. This is from last fall. Here's, here's a bluebird. He's, he's uh, she, excuse me, is there in, in the bath. And um, right in front of her is this little sugarberry seed. And so I, I mentioned that um, it was helpful, or I realized it was helpful to pay attention to where exactly, as I'm collecting the seeds, make a note of where, where the seed was found because later when I'm reviewing the photographs, it's, it's helpful to have some sense of where that seed is. So I would just, the top of the image is always 12 o'clock. This would be the four o'clock position. So that's another note I would make. Uh, I did have one day, this is past winter, uh, where it was just crazy. There were 37 spe uh, seeds of four different plant species. So English ivy, mistletoe, sugarberry, uh, which is related to hackberry, uh, and then some holly. And so I, there were so many that I actually had to do a little map, a little drawing of where all the seeds were, because otherwise it was just, it was just too much. All right, and then there's a lot of cleaning up the bird bath. So every day, swish it out, swish it out. Um, here I am examining some seeds, collecting some seeds, and then more swishing. And there's that pesky kayak on the, on the ground still, uh, and more swishing. So lots and lots of um, effort um, in, in, involved in this. All right, so I'm gonna break down my results into four broad categories. So I'm gonna talk about the bird visitors, so who exactly was visiting. I'll say something about the seeds themselves, what kinds of seeds are retrieved from the bird bath. And then uh, we'll say something about bird dispersal. And then finally, phenology, which is the study of seasonal changes in uh, biological phenomena. Okay, so some statistics from the camera. Um, 
So I actually have now at this point analyzed the data through the end of April. I'm behind because as you can imagine, it's really laborious, um, but I'm still taking pictures. Just last night, I swapped out the memory card on the camera yet again. And uh, so this isn't quite up to date, but most of what I'm going to present is based on this five months of data that I processed so far or at, at the time uh, I made some of these graphs. And at that time, that was about, it was over 100,000 photos that I had analyzed. Um, about 4% of them show at least one bird present. So there's a lot of just going through the images afterwards and there's not much happening. And then there'll be a burst of activity, a whole bunch of birds will visit, and then there'll be another pause. That's the usual pattern. Um, and for those five months, uh, about 4,400 birds were detected. Um, Right. Some of those detections, by the way, might include the same bird more than once. All right. So we need to keep that in mind as a robin might visit and be captured one minute and then the next minute it's still there. And then maybe one minute later, it's still there. So a detection isn't quite the same as the number of birds or the population of birds. Um, so just based on now, this is not the ad hoc observations. This is from the game camera itself and the photos that it took 29. I've, found or uh, identified 29 different bird species that visited the bird bath between September 1st and January 31st. So a lot of these are your classic backyard birds, right? The morning dove and chickadee, um, especially cardinal, uh, but there were some, some more interesting ones, right? So summer tanager, Baltimore Oriole kind of stuck around during a good bit of the winter. That was a surprise. I never actually saw it live and in person, but it was there. Um, hermit thrush surprised me that that was visit the bird bath, but oftentimes early in the morning, it would be there. The top visitors, so this is just the top five, for, again, for that five month period, um, the cardinal was the most common. It was about 30% of the, of the detections, followed by the bluebird, the tufted titmouse, the mockingbird, and the house finch. And probably next in line was uh, yellow rump warbler uh, was pretty common um, during, during the winter, and chipping sparrow also. Okay, but it's also worth noting that there's some common birds in the yard that really don't visit the birdbath much. So the Carolina wren, just a tiny fraction of all the visits were from Carolina wrens, and zero visits were from ruby count kinglets, even though the kinglets, pretty much on a daily basis in winter, they're there in the yard, they're even in that redbud tree above the birdbath. And I think there are probably a couple of reasons for this. One is that these are both insectivores. And so insect food is gonna be more rich in food, excuse me, rich in water than say seeds. Uh, so something like a, a cardinal or a chipping sparrow or a house finch, which is primarily, or a morning dove, which is primarily a seed eater, um, we would expect them to be visiting the bird bath more, more often because their food is relatively dry. Whereas these species, the wren and the kinglet, um, again, primarily insectivores, and so they get a lot of their, of their water just from their diet. Now, there may be more to it than that. So, for example, they may just, like the kinglet, may um, uh, visit knot holes or uh, have some other source, or maybe just doesn't prefer coming down and bathing in, uh, in a concrete structure. So I recognize that's a possibility, but I think it's significant that these birds um, were such infrequent visitors to the bird bath. So part of, part of visitation rate is driven by, I think, diet, but also there's no question that, um, that weather patterns, local weather patterns can make a really big difference. So back in, the, this is not a game camera photo, this is a photo just with a regular camera, but back in the fall of 2016, you may recall, we had a brutal drought. In Macon, we had 52 days without any rain. And at one point, when we were in the grip of that drought um, in November, I had 15 bird species visiting the bird bath. Here we got red-winged blackbird, which is not a common visitor, um, along with a bunch of morning doves. And so it's pretty clear that precipitation patterns also drive uh, visitation. If you have a period of clear weather for a couple of weeks every day, you see slightly more birds at the, at the bird bath drinking and or bathing. Okay, so that's the bird visitors. Let's, let's talk some about the, um, the seeds and what kind of seeds I discovered or found in, in the bath. So what seeds are dispersed <clears throat> to the bird bath? This is an image from this past winter. Um, the orangey seed here at left center is a sugarberry. 
Um, these two at the top right are English ivy, so uh, that's a, a non-native, you know, an invasive species. And then mistletoe, that was a pleasant surprise. These lovely little green seeds with this kind of slippery mucilage around them. Uh, but that's the first time I'd ever had mistletoe seeds ending up in my, in my bird bath. Another time, um, this again, this past winter, I had a banner day with three laurel cherries. So that's a native species of uh, cherry, but with really big seeds. Um, here's a smilax, that's a vine I mentioned, it's the thorny vine, and then five English ivy seeds. So over the years, actually this number is current as of today, because just today I added two more seeds. Um, there was a black gum, that's a nissa, and then there was also a magnolia seed um, in, in the bird bath today. So it's added up to over 2,500 seeds over the seven years of the, of the seed collection part of the study and quite a, quite a few species of plants. But it's also notable some plants just don't show up at all. Um, so for example, um, poison ivy, I know a lot of birds do eat poison ivy, but I have not found any poison ivy seeds yet in the bird bath. Um, what's another one? Um, coral beads, which is um, kind of a weedy vine um, and with really interesting little seeds that look sort of like a, an ammonite. And those, uh, I've seen birds eat um, coral beads fruit in my yard, but somehow it, it must not be really favored because I've never had it end up in the bird bath. All right, so here are um, some of the native plants that have whose seeds have found their way to the bird bath. I say roughly 16 because in some cases it's a little hard to know. So for example, like holly, um, there is native uh, American holly in my neighborhood, but there's also probably lots more um, hybrid and um, cultivated types of hollies. This black cherry, I have a question mark because we also in Macon have a lot of Yoshino cherries, which is an ornamental cherry. And so it could be black cherry, um, but it also, so there probably is some black cherry, but it could be Oshino cherry as well. So some of the, the trees that have shown up in flowering dogwood, Southern Magnolia, sugarberry, uh, mulberry, black gum. I mentioned I had one of those today, laurel cherry. That's one, one that is, um, gets dispersed in winter. And then um, shrubs from beautyberry, blackberry, blueberry, mistletoe. Um, although, I mean, mistletoe, I would consider it a shrub, even though it lives in, in treetops as, as like a hemi parasite. And then vines, smilax, Virginia creeper, and pokeweed is considered a forb. It's not, not a woody plant, but it's a big weedy uh, coarse plant. All right, and so here are some of the, the top species, the, the most, um, the ones with the most seeds brought to the bird bath is beautyberry here at top with this lovely fuchsia color. Um, it's really unique. Uh, and then pokeweed down below with its bright magenta pulp and it stains the fingers and the birds seem to really like both of those. Um, there are also a number of non-native plants, some of which are really noxious invasive species. Uh, so tallow tree is one and that one's really curious because I don't even know where that tree is. It's not in my yard because I wouldn't tolerate it, but it's, it's so that is coming from quite a distance. I mentioned there's some hybrid hollies, some of which are in my yard, Yoshino cherry, which is not particularly invasive, but it's still, it's an ornamental. Thorny olive or uh, thorny iliagnus is a real uh, problematic species in Macon, I imagine it is in the Atlanta area as well. Uh, this one surprised, surprised me, um, Oregon grape holly, Japanese privet, not, not very common, but occasionally would show up. And then Nandina and English ivy is probably one of the, the, the big ones as well. Um, right, and about of all the seeds, those 2,500 seeds that I've collected so far, about 16% were from exotic plants. That's, a, we have to take that with a grain of salt because I don't plant exotic plants in my yard. So we sh uh, we'd get a very different result if the bird bath were in the woods across the street, which is full of English ivy and um, thorny olive and privet. So that 16% number, I mean, it's actually impressive considering there are no invasive species in my, in my yard. I just, as I said, I don't really tolerate them uh, there in my yard. Um, so some of the top ones, I don't have pictures actually of the holly or Yoshino cherry. Those were the most abundant, but English ivy was another one uh, that the birds would, uh, would disperse to my yard from, from the woods across the street. I have a little bit remaining in my yard as ground cover that I haven't been able to knock back yet, but it's not producing fruit. 
and then tallow tree, uh, also called popcorn tree, which is a really um, noxious invasive plant. It's lovely, but it's, it's, it causes problems. Okay, so that's it for the, the um, seeds. Uh, so, but let's talk a little bit more about <clears throat> bird dispersal of those seeds. So what birds are dispersing these seeds um, to the bird bath and, you know, is the game camera doing its job? The whole reason I put the game camera there was so I could document which birds are dispersing the seeds to the bird bath. So that's the question. Is it actually a viable kind of technique? Uh, we know that we can study um, bird dispersal of seeds by just these ad hoc observations. We know that we can study uh, birds at banding stations, but does the game camera, is this, um, which seems to be a pretty novel technique, but is that, is that a good way of studying seed dispersal by birds? Okay, so here was my, we saw this list before actually. This is the list of the species that have visited the bird bath based on the game camera. And um, the ones I've highlighted are the species that are known to have um, a good bit of fruit in their diet. And the term we would use for them is frugivore, just like an herbivore is an organism that eats plants or a carnivore uh, eats, eats flesh or meat, um, frugivores eat fruit. So I've highlighted the species here that have more than 10% fruit in their diet. So these are the likely candidates at least for um, dispersing seeds to my bird bath. Red-bellied woodpecker, the flicker, bluebird, thrush, so a lot of members of the thrush family. So bluebird, the hermit thrush, the robin, and then members of another family, uh, the catbird, thrasher, mockingbird are all related, cedar waxwing and yellow rump warbler, and then cardinal. Now, cardinal is an interesting case because they do eat a good bit of fruit, but they also um, destroy the seeds. Uh, so those that with that big heavy bill, um, they typically would, would uh, grind up or um, just destroy the seeds that they consume in, in fruit. So. Uh, so yes, it's true that, that they do eat fruit, but they're very unlikely to be dispersing seeds to the bird bath. All right, so is there direct evidence for seed dispersal? In other words, now, so this is just my list of um, probable candidates, just based on who visits the bath and what I know from my own research and, and my observations, uh, what I know about who, who eats fruit and how much, um, but is that corroborated by the game camera? data. So that's what we'll look at next. All right, so this was um, January, late January this past winter, and you can see there's some ice on the ground. The bird bath was frozen first thing in the morning, so I had to bust up the ice. And we have these two uh, bird bath, uh, excuse me, bluebirds sitting on the rim. And pay, pay close attention to this bird down here at six o'clock and what, what she is, is about to do. Okay, all right, look what just happened. So this is one minute apart. So here's the initial image. One minute later, that bird has deposited something. She's regurgitated some pulp and some seeds from mistletoe. Now let's watch what happens with this bird up here and see what happens one minute later. Uh, plus we've been joined by a male bluebird, but look, now this bird at 12 o'clock has defecated out some uh, mistletoe seeds. So we had, so the game camera worked in this case. It documented um, birds, uh, both of them, bluebirds and both of them depositing uh, mistletoe seeds, but in different ways. So let's, let's zoom in. This is now looking at the left here. This is that regurgitated matter. This was from the bird at six o'clock um, on the close edge or rim of the bird bath. And so that uh, has a very different look from say these species here that have some seeds that are one, two, that with this little greenish hue, those are the um, seeds, but then there's a little bit of this uric, plus there's maybe another green seed underneath, but this white pasty stuff, that's uh, uric acid, which is part of the feces of, of birds. And so, um, so it turns out in this instance that um, these seeds are both regurgitated and um, defecated. So that's the means of, of dispersal. Here's another example. This is from January 8th. So we've got this bluebird once again sitting on the rim of the bird bath, and then a minute later, look what that bird has done. Uh, so this bird has defecated and um, left behind some uh, some seeds there on on the rim of the bath. I could do these all day, but here's another one. This is a Phoebe, uh, just sitting there chilling, uh, looking away from us. No, it's actually looking at us. But then here's a minute later, and now it's got its beady eye kind of trained on us. Now here's a minute later, look in front of the bird and what you see. 
is that bird is just regurgitated in English ivy seeds. So I thought that was fascinating because we think of the flycatchers as being mainly insect eaters, but they do, they are known to eat some fruit. So in this case, the Phoebe was probably across the street feeding on those English ivy fruits and then processed that fruit a little bit in its crop and then regurgitated it out into the bird bath. And then here a minute later, the bird is looking over its shoulder and there's the seed still sitting there in, in the basin. All right, here's another example. Uh, so this is from autumn, so not quite a year ago. We've got American robin sitting there on the rim and then look what happens a minute later. The bird starts marching into the water to take a bath maybe or to get a drink and then uh, coughs up, you know, regurgitates or disgorges this nice southern magnolia seed and then uh, the seed slides down a little bit um, into the basin and then the bird, the bird takes off. So, um, so yeah, the, the game camera does absolutely document birds dispersing seeds to the bath. And so let's take a look, take a look at which birds are carrying which seeds. Now this is based on 52 seeds uh, in that period of January 1st, excuse me, September 1st to January 31st. And uh, so yellow rump warbler, the only seed that I documented them dispersing was for Eastern red cedar, which uh, they're known to, to eat that. So, and that's a small, pretty manageable sort of um, fruit-like seed that they can disperse or yeah. Uh, cedar waxwing, which is not a common visitor in, to the bird bath typically, um, but they disperse mistletoe. Uh, we saw the picture of the Phoebe dispersing the English ivy seed, but now we start to get to species that have a little bit broader fruit diet. So the Northern Mockingbird dispersed three different species of seeds to the bird bath, sugarberry, Southern Magnolia, and then Virginia creeper. So we've got two trees and a vine represented there. American Robin has a very broad fruit diet and that's been known for quite some time, but sugarberry, English ivy, magnolia, black gum, and Virginia creeper. So a mix of um, native and non-native trees and vines. And then finally the bluebird, it turns out at least in my yard, the bluebird has the broadest fruit diet, including sugarberry, English ivy, magnolia, black gum, Virginia creeper, mistletoe, tallow tree, again, the invasive. And then of course, there's some small number of seeds that are um, that I haven't identified yet and may not be able to identify. All right, and if we look at a pie chart then of how many seeds each species, so the previous slide was just a list of what kinds of fruits each bird um, consumes, but here we're looking at uh, some summary statistics of just how many how many seeds are, are deposited by, by each species. So the bluebird, most of the seeds were deposited by bluebirds, followed by robins at 19%, and then mockingbirds. Less important, but still pretty interesting, were the yellow rock warbler, the waxwing, and the phoebe, all dispersed some small, smallish number of seeds into the birdbath. Okay, so how exactly do birds unload their ballast? And what I mean by that is, this is now for um, uh, 102 seeds, uh, where I could determine just by looking at the seed, typically if it was a nice clean seed deposited into the bath, then it was almost certainly regurgitated. If it was part of some fecal matter, then it was feces. But if you think about this from the bird's perspective, when they consume a fruit, a portion of that fruit is consists of seeds, which are not gonna be digested by the bird. And so it's to the bird's advantage to unload that ballast. And kind of surprisingly, um, only 12% of the seeds were actually defecated out. The vast majority, 88% of the seeds, uh, at least for that five month period, uh, were, were actually regurgitated out. So I, that to me was a very surprising result. And I think I'm, I'm happy with that because it showed that this, um, this technique of setting uh, seed dispersal by birds using a game camera it may, maybe has given us some new insight into exactly how birds are moving seeds around. I mean, the traditional story is they swallow the seeds and then they defecate them out. Um, but at least in the context of bird baths, they tend to regurgitate seeds. All right, now, only about two thirds of the seeds, uh, for only about two thirds of them was I able to match the seed with its disperser. Meaning, you know, I could see in the bird bath oftentimes when the seed appeared or I could see it there, but I wasn't able to assign a, a species of bird to that. So, so why is that exactly? Well, there are a number of reasons. One is sometimes there's glare on the surface of the water and you just can't see the seeds at the bottom of the bird bath or their shadows. Or for very small dark seeds, 
they are harder to see. If you've got a really big seed like a laurel cherry or a pale colored seed like um, Southern Magnolia, those seeds show up. Um, then also some seeds just appear uh, because the, remember the game camera is only taking pictures every once, once every minute. And so if a bird visits for a brief period and deposits seed, that's not gonna be captured by the camera. And then there's this other thing, the rugby effect, which I'll explain in just a second, so bear with me. Here's an example of a seed just appearing. So uh, here, here we are, we just see the bird bath. This is at 2.42 p.m. and last November. Well, one minute later, there suddenly a seed just appeared. It's a sugarberry seed. So, and, and we see these splash marks. So probably what happened was, so I'm gonna go back a minute. So here's a 2.42, 2.43. So probably a bird came, bathed for a little bit, splashed around, regurgitated out the seed and then took off before I got a picture of it. So sometimes that's just unavoidable uh, unless I had a continuous video or something, I'm not gonna capture every single bird to the bird bath. What about the so-called rugby effect? Well, I did have one kind of amazing day last winter where uh, there were all these cedar wax wings and here's a, we see a laurel cherry seed, here's a, probably a sugarberry seed. There were a bunch of seeds in here Plus you see some droppings on, here's some droppings on the rim of the bird bath. And so it's like a rugby scrum. I can't tell which bird. There were so many birds coming and going, it wasn't possible really to tell which birds were depositing the seeds. I just know it was almost certainly robins and waxwings. So sometimes I, I'm not gonna be able to pin it down to the exact species. Okay, so we've talked about the birds, the seeds, um, we looked at some at bird dispersal. What about phenology? Again, phenology is this study of seasonal progression of uh, biological phenomena like flowering or fruiting, that sort of thing. So what is what can we learn about the phenology of fruit production just based on bird bath data? Well, if you, if you do this now, the downside is that it took me about seven years to, to accumulate enough data for it to really be meaningful, but this is showing over the course of a year, so from January to November, or excuse me, to December. So here's the month of the year. And then the seed number is on our y-axis here. And these are three summer fruiting species. We've got the black cherry, which actually could be Yoshino cherry as well, or could include some. And then here we've got a mulberry, this tiny little seed, and then Smilax. And they all produce fruit now. Smilax is a little bit later, more like July and August, versus black cherry and mulberry are early in the summer. There are also what I would call fall or fall winter fruiting plants. And that includes Southern Magnolia, uh, Flowering Dogwood, Virginia Creeper, and then finally Sugarberry. And we see that most of them, like for example, Virginia Creeper had a real peak in September and then went down in October and November and so on. Um, some were more just sort of persisted at low levels. Um, low levels would show up in the winter. Then you have um, winter fruiting plants. A lot of these are invasive. Um, so English ivy is one, um, thorny olive, which I don't have on this graph here, but thorny olive is another winter fruiting one, nandina is another fruiting one, the privets. So it turns out a lot of our invasive species really produce fruit um, in, in wintertime. Okay, so we can, I would argue, we can learn a lot by just paying attention to what's going on in our backyards and in particular at our bird baths here. This is not from the game camera, this is just a photo of four different species. We had a cardinal who probably just drank, so her head is tilted back there. We've got the morning dove, a little chipping sparrow, and then a female house finch. Uh, so we can uh, learn some interesting things about bird behavior and about the reliance on fruit by just studying the birds in our backyard. And so I'm doing some of that work with my students at West End College. This is Mackie and Jordan. This is uh, We presented some of this work. You see the picture of the bird bath in the background, but we presented some of this work and we're continuing it this fall and we hope to be, well, we will be presenting this work also at the GOS meeting on Jekyll Island. So thinking about the utility of the game camera, you know, as a technique, I would say, first of all, it's rigorous, it's standardized. So that's, that's good. That's an improvement over say, just ad hoc observations where you just wander around and watch what the birds are doing. So it's standardized, so that's, that's good from the standpoint of data collection and rigor. You don't, unlike banding birds, you don't require you don't need a permit to do this, right? It doesn't take any special training. I'm not re removing birds from mist nets, not doing anything of that sort. Um, you just have to be willing to slog through a lot of photos. It's pretty inexpensive. Uh, also very data rich, extremely data rich. I mentioned that I've already reviewed probably more than 150,000 photos and I'm not even done, I'm just up through April. The downside though, as you can imagine, is the amount of time it takes to process the samples and then also data storage. So you need a big external hard drive to back up all the data. 
it just so it's just literally clogged up my computer this summer and really slowed things down. So I would say the method is, is a win, the methodology is a win, a win, but what have we learned in terms of the ecology of birds? Uh, let me take a step back for just a second and think about the nature of science. And uh, I've got a, a quote here that, that I thought was really interesting. It's from the co-discoverer of REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And this is a quote from him. And what he says is, um, according to my anti-intellectual golden manure theory of discovery, a painfully accurate, well-focused probe of any minutia is almost certain to divulge a heretofore unknown nugget of science. So have we discovered, have we turned over any, um, you know, unknown nuggets of science from the bird bath study? So uh, I would say yes. So our, our birds have deposited some, some golden manure of, of their own. And we've learned, I think, a, a bunch about lots of different things. So bird diets, what are they eating? Uh, we can, we've learned some about seed dispersal, fruiting phenology, what time of year are these birds dispersing seeds, um, invasive species, um, so we can compare the um, uh, movement of seeds of both native and non-native seeds, uh, biodiversity, because that's affected very much by invasive species, especially invasive plants that are dispersed by birds, and then just frugivory, right, the study of the ecology of, of fruit-eating birds. So at this point, uh, I'm just going to wind down here. This is just a picture from last, the day after Christmas last year, just showing four different species. I thought this was a wonderful picture. We've got a chickadee, we've got a bluebird bathing here, there's a yellow rump warbler, and then also a pine warbler. Um, those are always the fun images when you're going through this long slog of looking at lots of pictures and you happen across an image like this. It's just, it's just magical. But I would be happy to take any questions, and I guess I'll stop sharing my screen. And I think Dottie will help with, with um, mediating some of the, the question and answer. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Jim. That was, that was fascinating. I have a question. Do your students help you slog through all this data? You know, they have. And we, what we did last fall was uh, they had their own game cameras on campus and they each had their own bird bath that they were responsible for. And uh, we built little wooden stands for those bird baths. And so, yeah, they've had some experience with, with doing okay. that. Now it's harder for them as they're just so busy with all their other classes. It's hard mm -hmm. for them to really find the time to go through the images, but they have done some of that. And right today, actually, we were going through a bunch of the data, the data sheets. Fascinating. Um, so what determines whether an ingested seed is digested or passes through the GI tract undigested? Yeah. Some birds eat the seeds for actual seeds themselves, while others eat fruit, and those seeds are simply an unused byproduct. Right. Yeah. So, uh, right. So for many of the, so like the robin and the bluebird, they are not seed eaters. They, they're consuming the, the benefit for them in consuming the fruit is the pulp. Uh, and so they'll, they'll get the nutrients um, from, and the calories from, from the pulp, and then the seed is just really unwanted uh, ballast. And in terms of what determines whether they, uh, that seed passes all the way through their gut or if they regurgitate it, I think it's partly linked to seed size. So, for example, laurel cherry has these huge, uh, really massive seeds. They're like the size of a chickpea almost, you know, they're really big. And so first of all, only certain birds can even swallow them, they're so big. But then also I suspect that that's one that simply wouldn't pass through their digestive tract. Um, and so the waxwings and robins would regurgitate, would be much more likely to regurgitate that one out. I think there's also probably a connection there with seed number. So something like Virginia, uh, excuse me, um, Beautyberry, which is that, that lovely little shrub with the fuchsia colored berries, has lots of seeds per, per fruit. And pokeweed has multiple seeds per fruit. So it's probably, uh, those seeds I would imagine are more likely to pass all the way through the bird's digestive tract just because they're numerous and they're small. Same thing for blueberry. Uh, it would be, so these, those blueberry seeds are so tiny, I think it would be difficult for the bird to regurgitate them without also losing the pulp and some of the, uh, the part of the fruit that has the nutritive value. Okay, um, somebody noted that she didn't have any seeds from giant ragweed, and she said she'd heard that that was important to migrating birds and knows that people have strong opinions about the plant, and she was wondering if you had any opinions on the giant ragweed. Huh. Um, well, I don't, uh, I'm not that familiar with the species, but uh, I, 
I don't think it's a fleshy fruit. So if birds are eating it, then they're destroying it, um, would be my guess, rather than really dispersing it. But I, I, I'm not really familiar with the species. I just, I can't imagine that it really has a fruit that is actually appealing to, to birds. But I don't know, I'd be, I'd be curious to learn more about that. But there are, you know, there are plenty of native plants as well that are, the birds rely on like sweet gum is a great example of a tree with a lot of wildlife value. I mean, I don't know if I would plant one next to my house, but they're, they, uh, lots of birds are attracted to the seeds and they destroy those seeds, right? So they're not dispersing them. Interesting. Um, somebody asks about Nandina and oh. hearing that they're toxic. Can you, yes. can you speak to the toxicity of Nandina? Right. Yeah, that's an interesting one because I only had, I think, one or two Nandina seeds end up in the bird bath. And my neighborhood is full of Nandina. I don't have any in my yard, but there's a bunch within 100 yards of my house. Uh, it is toxic to birds. It has a cyanide compound, especially um, cedar waxwings are susceptible to it, partly because they tend to gorge on fruits and eat large numbers. But in my experience, it is a very showy fruit. Um, it's sort of an old school planting, at least in Macon, it seems to be that it's in more established neighborhoods. But um, it doesn't seem to be really preferred. Uh, a lot of times those brightly colored sea fruits will persist all through winter without anybody really eating them. I mean, I've seen hermit thrushes eat them. I guess I've seen waxwings, maybe robins, but they just don't seem to be really preferred, which is, a, I guess, a good thing because they are toxic, at least to waxwings and, and presumably to other birds as well. Do you have any um, native plants that you would recommend for planting in your yard that are, what would you say are the highest nutritional value plants yeah. for birds? Well, uh, I, I think Virginia creeper, it's, it's not one that you probably would go out and plant, but I mean, you, you tolerate it. So I've got a really nice one growing up a pine tree in my yard and I just, I tolerate it. I don't let, you know, I'm not gonna cut that down even though it's, it's a vine growing up on a tree. So that's a great one with, um, with antioxidants in it that the birds really like, and it has some decent caloric content. So that's one that's good. Plus it has really beautiful foliage in autumn. Um, in terms of trees, I love black gum. That's just a fabulous tree. To me, it's got it all. It's got a nice growth form. It's got beautiful foliage in autumn. Um, the downside is it's only the female trees that are gonna yield fruit. So you, you might have to plant more than one of those. Just It's like with the hollies, right? It's only the female. Um, holly bushes will yield fruit. So you might need more than one black gum, but that is one that I think is a fantastic tree. Flowering dogwood is also great, very high in, in lipids. Southern magnolia, I mean, you need a lot of space for that because it has a very big footprint, but that's, that's a great tree for, um, for a lot of migratory birds in fall. You know, all your thrushes, vireos, woodpeckers, um, they just, I had one of those in my yard, previous yard in Macon. The birds absolutely love that. Interesting. Well, we'll remind you that we have our native plant sale going on right now. So, so order away. Um, we don't have any more questions. Does anybody else have something else they'd like to drop in the Q&A? Um, if not, we will wrap this up. And Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Um, You're very welcome. That was fascinating. And there's just so much data there. It's um, yeah. How long are you going to keep this? Oh, Michelle and I had one more question. Sure. What does your wife think of this? <laughs> uh, she tolerates me. I mean, when I'm out of town, I have to rope my family into cleaning the bird bath because <laughs> I can't, I can't miss a day. Right. So yeah, but they tolerate me and they, they put up with me. Um, but yeah, I'll probably, it is very labor intensive. So I think I'm going to continue with the game camera through the end of the calendar year because that'll be you know a year plus a few months and then I just have to stop at some point um I don't know that I'll ever stop paying attention to the seeds that end up in the bird bath I just think that's so interesting that, that really that, is fascinating that's lower and impact it's going to I was going to say now now I'm motivated to go out and yeah. learn my now my seeds and oh, yeah I'm doing well with my plants but now yeah. the seeds are well, a great way to learn them is to just, you know, go out and when you see some interesting fruit in your neighborhood, squish it in your, between your fingers and see what the seeds look like. And before you know it, you know, you'll, you'll know what a pokeweed seed looks like, Virginia creeper, Southern magnolia. Um, it's just, it's, it adds another layer of, of interest, I suppose, when you're, when you're out birding, you know, you can explore some of that, the botany of those, of those fruits and seeds. Somebody asks if you know whether seeds fall into the bird bath. 
in... Yeah, occasionally. Um, so things like there are, uh, there's a redbud tree right over the bath. So they will, those seeds, you know, the pods, but that's not bird dispersed. So I just ignore those. Um, occasionally a, an entire Virginia creeper berry will fall in. And I know that that's from the vine growing up the pine tree right next to the bird bath. So that's really the only one. Virginia creeper is the only one that could really directly fall in. And I know when it has, or I suspect strongly, because if it shows up as an entire fruit. Now, occasionally birds like today, there was a magnolia seed that still had the red fleshy covering on it. I mean, it was an entire fruit and clear, or well, technically fleshy seed, but still a bird had clearly carried that in its crop and didn't digest it or mash it up and just regurgitated the whole thing into the bath, which is a little puzzling. But so sometimes I will get seeds that I think maybe a, per, a bird perched above the bath. That may also explain some of those mystery seeds that just show up and there's no evidence of any bird is that a bird may be preening, let's say, in the redbud tree and then it regurgitates a seed that lands in the bath. Um, somebody asks if you tolerate poison ivy in your yard. I know that is a, a native and yeah. an excellent, an excellent right. seed producer. Yeah, I don't have any. Um, I mean, there's a bunch in the woods across the way. Um, I suppose I would tolerate it. I, I'm terribly sensitive to it. But if it were up a tree, um, then I wouldn't mind as much. Um, but I probably wouldn't, honestly, wouldn't tolerate it at the ground level just because then I'd be getting into it when I, if I was weeding or doing yard work. But if you can tolerate or if you've got a scruffy edge or maybe a patch of woods at the back of your property, uh, yeah, I would tolerate lots of birds really like that. You know, downy woodpeckers, yellow rump warblers, chickadees, lots of, lots of species will eat poison ivy berries. Well, that wraps up the questions and we're okay. coming up to the top of the hour, but um, a million thanks for the presentation. You're welcome. And, um, um, I'm very, very fascinated by, the, by your work. So um, Great. Well, thank hope you. To see, hope to see you at something soon and everybody, thank you very much for joining us and we hope to see you at one of our upcoming Georgia Crest Native for Birth Month events. Y'all have a good evening. Okay. Thanks. Good night. Bye everyone.